I'm John Corkery. I'm an associate dean here at John Marshall Law School, and Dean Johnson is away uh, on a conference at Korea today, so I've been asked to uh, welcome you all. We're very, very glad to have you at this Braun Lecture. We think it's going to be a terrific program. We've got some uh, really exciting guests and a topic I know that's going to spark interest and controversy. So on behalf of the law school, I want to thank you all for coming. We're very glad you're here. And I'm going to introduce right now the chairman of this year's committee, uh, Professor Michael <coughs> Pellelli, who will introduce the program and our guests. Michael? Well, thank you, John. And I certainly want to welcome you as well to our uh, 12th annual uh, Bell R. and Joseph H. Braun Distinguished Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, Joseph Brown was a uh, alumnus of the school, and he spent most of his career uh, in the area of law affecting motorists. He was at uh, various times director, general counsel, and secretary of the AAA Chicago Motor Club. He helped write the original driver, driver's license law in, the, uh, in Illinois, and also worked on the um, State of Illinois Insurance Code in 1935. He was the national chairman of the Committee on Uniform Traffic Laws for a number of years. And it's really uh, owing to his generosity and that of his wife that we are able to have this series. Uh, the topic is fatal attractions, media violence, and American culture. Uh, and we picked the topic because we assumed that there'd be some ambivalence here between our concern about freedom of expression uh, as contrasted also with our concern, however, with the effects of violence in society. Um, however, as I was scanning the email traffic about the Sopranos, I came across this opinion. In my opinion, this is by one of the uh, correspondents, this season is the best so far. Uh, the reason being there's more sex and violence. All the people I talk to agree because that is what they want to see from this show. Now, there may, there may be uh, a view out there that does not have any ambivalence about it. But I think looking at the law, there's always been a kind of ambivalence uh, between on the one hand trying to protect freedom of expression, yet recognizing as the court has that freedom of speech has never been absolute. And on the other hand, uh, some concern about the effect of certain kinds of speech on society. Uh, the Supreme Court in Brandenburg versus Ohio, echoing Oliver Wendell Holmes' clear and present danger test, stated in 1969 that government cannot forbid advocacy of the use of force or even a violation of a law unless the advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to produce such action. Now that test, which has a long and respected lineage going back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, was designed with political movements in mind. Radical perhaps, but nonetheless political movements, ranging all the way from communism on the left to fascism on the right. It seems to me that what we're confronted with now is a new form of media communication uh, that either portrays violence for its own sake or for the sake of some commercial advantage without any broader social message. Lower courts have reacted uh, somewhat to this. In the print media, we have two cases. One is Braun versus Soldier of Fortune, in which uh, Mr. Savage put an ad in the Soldier of Fortune magazine. And he described himself this way, 37-year-old mercenary desires job. Vietnam vet, discreet and very private. Bodyguard, courier, and other special skills. All jobs considered. He received 30 to 40 calls from people who wanted to murder other individuals, assault them, or kidnap them. He accepted one of the offers and did kill a business partner. But the suit was not against Mr. Savage, but against Soldier of Fortune magazine for running the ad. And the Court of Appeals uh, upheld the verdict and said the First Amendment has not been violated so long as this lawsuit for negligence 
proved that the ad on its face would have alerted a reasonable publisher about a clearly identifiable risk of a serious crime. So that was the first major precedent. Five years later, there's another case, Rice versus Paladin. Here, it was a book. A publisher of a book called Hitman described in detail how you go about um, becoming successful at this profession, being a hitman. <coughs> An individual followed the details in the book to the letter and practice of being a hitman. The a lawsuit was brought by relatives of the deceased, and the court found that the killer in this case was attracted by the book's title, followed the instructions in the book, and hard though it may be to believe, the court noted that the publisher had stipulated, quote, it not only knew the book's, in book's instruction might be used by murderers, but intended to provide assistance to murderers and would-be murderers. Uh, some language in the opinion indicates that even if there had not been that stipulation, they still would have found liability. Uh, it seems to me those precedents will sooner or later come knocking at the door of the electronic media. Uh, in fact, earlier this year there was a lawsuit, you may have read about it, in the Louisiana State Courts against Oliver Wendell Stone, uh, Oliver Stone, uh, the wrong Oliver, Oliver Stone. Interesting hybrid. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and AOL Time Warner. A couple uh, tr imitating uh, natural born killers, the couple in the movie, went about a crime spree, wound up paralyzing a girl who ultimately died. Suit was brought on her behalf on the theory that this murderous couple was imitating what was going on in the movie. In that case, the judge threw the case out of court because he said there was no evidence to indicate the defendants intended to incite violence using the basic test that the Supreme Court upheld many years ago in Brandenburg. But note, that went off on a notion of intent rather than negligence. Earlier this month, you may have read, even in our own neighborhood, a certain Luther Castile was charged with shooting more than a dozen people at JB's bar in Elgin, Illinois. And what caught my eye was, was a um, quotation from his girlfriend who said, he called me his Mallory. That's the name of the girl in Natural Born Killers. It seemed like he was living in the movie. So there is the beginning of this concern, at least in some quarters, about the effect of the media, <coughs> at least on certain vulnerable individuals in our society. Even more so, it seems to me, is the concern about children. The National Association of Theater Owners noted that in 1999, almost half of the teenage population between 12 and 17 saw at least one movie a month, compared with only 12% of adults 18 or older. So a question has come up, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it this afternoon, about the rating system and how it works or doesn't work. Uh, there was an uproar when a studio publicist was reported to have written a memo about marketing an R-rated movie called Disturbing Behavior. In that memo, it was reported that he said, our goal is to find the elusive teen target audience and make sure everyone between 12 and 18 is exposed to the film. Uh, another instance, it seems to me, of this emerging discontent is an FTC uh, report in which they noted that some music video companies engaged in a two-tier strategy. One, affix affixing warning labels to placate parents, while at the same time trying to induce teens to work around the labels. It seems to me, though, the most significant development is the joint statement on the impact of entertainment violence on children, which was issued uh, July of last year, and I think you have a copy that was passed out, in which uh, this joint statement was issued by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Psychological Association, and the American Medical Association. And it seems to me one of the pertinent uh, uh, excerpts here is the statement, at this time, well over 1,000 studies, including reports from the Surgeon General's Office, the National Institute of Mental Health, 
in a number of studies conducting by, conducted by leading figures within our medical and public health organizations point overwhelmingly to a causal connection between media violence and aggressive behavior in some children. The conclusion of the public health community based on 30 years of research is that viewing entertainment violence can lead to a, uh, increases in aggressive attitudes, values and behavior, especially in children. Now you have to read the entire report because there is a caveat. It does say that we don't know that media violence is the sole cause or even the most important cause of this violence and we certainly don't intend to restrict creative activity. In fact, the report says what we're doing is simply describing what's happening. We're not prescribing any remedies. Well, I think that the stirrings are there, at least, for some groups to try to think and create remedies. Uh, you may have seen, as I did, news clips of Congress summoning Hollywood executives to a congressional hearing for a dressing down in public. Uh, and I was left wondering what the point of it all was, that it seemed to me very unclear what it is that Congress wanted or intended to do, if anything, for what could be done. Some have been more specific. Uh, one is the outgoing FCC Commissioner Gloria Tristani, who has said we should simply classify hardcore violence the same way we classify hardcore pornography, uh, namely not protected by the First Amendment. <coughs> And her argument is, and it's true, although it's been difficult to define obscenity, and some would say impossible, the fact is the court has tried to define it and has said once we define it, it's absolutely not protected by the First Amendment. So it's an intriguing thought, uh, and it raises the question why there are two standards, one for obscenity, which is not protected by the First Amendment, and one for hardcore violence that has been generally given a more liberal treatment in terms of some version of a clear and present danger test. Uh, fortunately, we have two speakers who are really expert in this area and can uh, shed some light on this. Our first is Mr. Jack Valenti, who is a true Renaissance man. Texas born, Harvard educated, he has led several different lives, including that of a wartime bomber pilot, the founder of an ad agency, a political consultant, a White House special assistant, and a movie industry leader. Born in Houston, Texas, he was at the age of 15, the youngest high school graduate in the city. I don't know, has that record still been kept? I'm not sure. Bad school system. <laughs> <laughs> he received his BA from the University of Houston and an MBA from Harvard. He was a pilot in World War II and flew 51 combat missions for the U.S. Air Force in Italy. He has received the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with four clusters, the Distinguished Unit Citation with one cluster, and the European Theater Ribbon with four battle stars. And the French government has decorated him with its Distinguished French Legion of Honor Award. In the 1950s, he co-founded an advertising and political consulting agency called Weekly and Valenti. During that period, he met the Senate Majority Leader, uh, Lyndon Johnson, and as Mr. Valenti said during lunch, everybody in Texas knew uh, the Senate Majority Leader at that time. Anyway, um, after the assassination of JFK, uh, Jack Valenti flew back to Washington with Lyndon Johnson and became a special assistant to the new president. Currently, he is chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association over which he has presided for some 35 years. So there's really no one who can really provide such an overview of the developments in that industry, it seems to me. As an author, he has written three nonfiction works, The Bitter Taste of Glory, A Very Human President, and Speak Up with Confidence. His latest book is a political novel entitled Protect and Defend by Doubleday. He has written numerous essays, for the LA Times, the Washington Post, Reader's Digest, Atlantic Monthly, and Newsweek. Along with other Hollywood legends, he has his own star in Hollywood's walkway of fame. Our second speaker is a little closer to us, at least to us Chicagoans. Uh, he is the co-host of Ebert and Roper in the Movies. Uh, this show is one of the longest running television programs and one of the most influential. 
Richard Roper, as we well know in Chicago, does a daily column in the Chicago Sun-Times, which is distributed nationally by the New York Times Syndicate. He has been writing this column since 1987 and has received many awards for it, including the National Headliner Award. Richard Roper is the co-author of He Rents, She Rents, A Guide to Guy Movies and Chick Flicks. And I think this was well before Gray, uh, you know, the Mars and Venus uh, uh, comparison. Okay, he is also author of Urban Legends, published by Career Press, now in its fourth printing, and coming out soon in paperback. And he's now at work on a sequel this year. Is it? And um, so I, we expect uh, that that will be out relatively soon. Over the last 10 years, he has hosted talk shows uh, on a number of Chicago radio stations. He is a regular commentator on WFLD, the Fox station in Chicago. And he serves as a substitute co-host, in fact, for WFLD's morning program, Fox Thing in the Morning. Our speaker, uh, Richard Roper, has also appeared in programs such as Oprah, Nightline, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, uh, as well as other numerous TV programs. For his work, he has received two Midwest Chicago Emmys. And it seems to me in conclusion that his, his career confirms what Mike Royko many years ago predicted, uh, that Richard Roper was one of the rising stars in Chicago journalism. We are very fortunate, as I said, to have these two people, and I will now turn the program over to them uh, with an opportunity for questions after their presentation. Mr. Valetti? Yes. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. A little brief, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that. Uh, it was not until last night that I knew, uh, I guess it's my fault I wasn't reading my mail, I didn't realize we were going to have a debate. Uh, I was planning to really talk about my political career and not much about movies, uh, so <laughs> that's true, I really was. And now I'm, I'm going to have to sort of revise myself and, and play it as it goes. First thing I'm going to do is set my stopwatch. But let me tell you a story about this. <clears throat> When I was growing up in southeast Texas, uh, the grandson of Sicilian immigrants who somehow managed to mush their way from Ellis Island down to Texas in the 1890s, this was a town where there were very few Catholics, and I can assure you, damn fewer Sicilians. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, all of my friends obviously were neither Catholic nor Sicilian. So I'd go to 7 o'clock Mass with my family, and uh, where the Jesuits were lecturing us pretty sternly. And then I would go to what we call in Texas Brush Arbor Revivals, where you get a big tent and you cast it over thirsty, parched, uh, really hard Texas prairie, and you put about five or six hundred folding chairs and a pulpit like this. And these itinerant traveling circuit preachers would come and speak for several hours, just kicking the hell out of the devil every minute of the way. <laughs> so on this particular Sunday, I was 10 years old with my friend and his father, there approaches the pulpit, the most notorious speaker of them all, a man who could go five or six hours and never even looked like he wanted to go to the bathroom. And uh, when he mounted, he took a big pocket watch and he put it right in front of him. And uh, my young friend tugged at his daddy, and he says, Daddy, what does it mean when the preacher brings out that watch? And the father leaned down and whispered, he said, son, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started my stopwatch. <laughs> I've been very fortunate in, in that I've been able to have all of my adult career inhabited in two of life's classic fascinations, politics and movies. And I've found in both those worlds that I've known the great and the near great and those who thought they were great. You want to guess which is the largest category of them all? <laughs> and I've found a strange anomaly. Well, not so strange when you think about it. 
that movie actors and politicians are really cut from the same DNA, if you'll pardon my O.J. Simpson allusion here. And am I going too fast for this group, O.J. Simpson? Oh, forget it. Just, don't worry about it. We'll come back to it later. At any rate, <clears throat> movie stars and politicians are both are in a glamorous but unpredictable business. They both have power, both addicted to power, always on stage, hooked on applause, and always reading from scripts written by someone else. Indeed, so close are they that it is very difficult to tell which is the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood or Washington, D.C., and I know what my answer is, I can tell you that. I, uh, I came to the movie business through a circuitous route, and uh, I want to tell you briefly about it because it had a great deal to do with how I approach things today. I got a call in October of 1963, before most of you in this room were born. The vice president was calling me, and he said, uh, the president is coming to Texas. He and Governor John Conley have made a deal. I think it's wrong because the Democratic Party was at that time in venomous discord, and OBJ didn't think that was a propitious moment, not because of hostility to the president, but because of, 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 the, of the venomous hatred between Governor Connolly on one side and Senator Ralph Yarborough on the other. But he said, I want this trip to go good. I want your agency to handle all the press, and I want you to be personally involved. And by the way, this was uh, all pro bono. Vice President Johnson was a great believer in pro bono work, I want you to know. And so I said, yes, sir, of course. And I deployed all of my people, San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas. Then we're going on to Austin for a big climaxing dinner on Friday night. I flew with the vice president <coughs> to Fort Worth on the evening of, of January, of November 21st, 1963. And then from the Fort Worth Hotel, after speeches by JFK and LBJ, then we got an airplane and flew the short distance to Dallas. And I got into the motorcade in Dallas, about six cars back of the president. It was a, a jubilant day. There wasn't a hostile face in the crowd. And the motorcade passed by these, these cheering throngs. And I thought, my God, what a great day for the president. And I sort of preened myself because I, I was going to let LBJ know that I was personally responsible for having all these people out there cheering the president. We came out of the underpass and on to what is known as Dealey Plaza Pass, an undistinguished uh, piece of architecture called the Texas School Book Depository. And suddenly, without warning, the car in front of us went from 8 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. People began to mill around, and I did not know what happened. And I told our driver, let's go to the Texas, I mean, to the trademark in Dallas where the president was going to make a speech. And I'm sure he's late, and that's why the motorcade is broken up. When we got to the trademark, there were 2,500 people, but no president. And I knew something was dismally wrong. And I went up to a fellow sprouting wires out of his ear, a Secret Service man. I identified myself when he said, Mr. Lenny, the president's been shot and the governor's been shot. And they're at Parkland Hospital. He got me in a deputy sheriff's car. And we went out to Parkland Hospital. And I got in in the basement. People were milling around, thickly crowded, somber. Uh, hysteria was hanging like Spanish moss from the ceiling. And then there approached me one of Lyndon Johnson's inner counsel, a man named Cliff Carter, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I've been looking all over for you. The vice president wants you now. And then he, a little beat, a little pause, and he said, the president is dead, you know. When I started coming unglued, he said, get, compose yourself. We've got to get to the vice president. And when we got to a little room, he was, he was sequestered. It was empty except for one lone Secret Service man. And he said, I'm to take you to Air Force One right now. We got into a police car. Air Force One had been moved to a remote corner of Love Field and was now heavily under guard by two cordons of menacing and, uh, and, and heavily armed uh, men with Uzis at the ready. Finally, we got on Air Force One. And in those days, a 707, the forward part, 35 seats for staff and press. Midships is a presidential office. After that is the presidential bedroom, and after that is the galley. When I got aboard, Johnson was not there, but the office was really crowded with people. And suddenly, from the rear of the plane came this six-foot-four figure of Johnson. He sat down, and he beckoned to me. And I came over, and he said, 
I want you on my staff. I want you to fly back to Washington with me, just like that. He didn't say, would you like to be on my staff? Or how would that suit you? It was a command, and I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. And then I asked him two very dumb questions. As I look back on it, I'm sure he thought, who is this cretin that I've hired? First question was, I said, Mr. President, I don't have any clothes. I just uh, go into Austin tomorrow, tonight, and I don't have any. He said, well, buy some when you get there. And call your wife and have her send some up. Okay, then I asked him the real dumb question. I said, I don't have a place to live. And he said, okay, you can live with me until your family comes up. <laughs> now, I did. I lived on the third floor of the mansion, the, the living quarters of the president on the second floor. And I had a little tiny little two-room suite, a sitting room, bathroom, and a, and a bedroom. Now, I don't recommend this close communion with the president because <coughs> uh, he did not get more than four or five hours sleep a night, didn't need it. And we'd work all day uh, until about nine o'clock at night and all the other special assistants have gone home. But since I am home, I'm there. <laughs> and uh, finally about 11 o'clock, he called me into his of office and said, let's go ahead and get a little supper and maybe talk a little bit. And we'd go up to the second floor of the mansion and talk till about one o'clock in the morning. And then I'd hold my butt into bed, just bone tired. And at about 5.45, every morning, the phone would ring. He said, well, come on down. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> one morning, I really got off a good line. I, I, I've, I wanted this enshrined in Bartlett's quotations. He called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, Mr. President, I've just been lying here hoping you'd call. <laughs> and we'd go down his bedroom. I mean, his bedroom. He's sitting up in bed with a battery of phones. He's on the phone. He's working. And about 8.30, we would head on down to the Oval Office. And uh, that went on for a month and a half. And I'll tell you, when my family finally got up, I felt liberated that at least I was going to have a little time off, except that the president didn't work on an hourly schedule. He worked on a calendar. And therefore, on Saturday's afternoon, he called and said, come on down, help me with a speech here. And Sunday, I said, why don't you come over and we'll have a little brunch. So in a sense, uh, I was umbilically tied to him. And, uh, presidents never get tired because people are always saying, God love you. And they're making uh, all sorts of affectionate embraces. And it's like taking a big, giant syringe of heroin and right up your veins of, of, of to presidents. But staff members do get tired because nobody's telling them how much they love them. At any rate, uh, I was at that time in charge of the president's schedule, which means I sat outside his office. And that's a pretty powerful position because you had to go through me to see him. And then I was head of all the speech writing. And third, I was on a special inter council task force on Vietnam. So I in involved in all the Vietnam meetings for three years. And then one day, a man came into my office named Lou Wasserman. At that time, he was the most powerful man in Hollywood, the head of Universal Studios. And today, even in retirement, he's, he's an icon. And he had this enormous impact on my life next to Lyndon Johnson. And he said, the job of leader of the film industry is open. We want you to take it. The board of directors, which was composed at that time of Jack Warner and Darrell F. Zanuck and all the giants, so he said, uh, I've checked it out with them and they will vote for you. And I said, I'm sorry, Lou, I can't do it. I can't leave the president now. But Wasserman didn't get to where he was by taking no for an answer. He kept coming back and I kept saying no. And then the compensation kept going up and all the perks began to spread a little bit. And, and finally he caught my attention. And, uh, but the last time he came in, he said, the fourth time, he said, I'm not going to come back and bother you anymore. But I want you to answer one question. And the question is, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? He said, this job is transitory. You won't be here one second longer than your prince. And I had to concede that. So he said, when Johnson leaves, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? When I speak at universities now, and I try to do that as often as I can, and even high schools, I say, when you get in your mid-30s, you're going to have to answer that question. 
what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I knew I didn't want to go back in the advertising business. I was been in 11 years, built an agency. I'd lost my zest for it. I didn't want oil production or land development, though I could probably have made millions, and my friends in Texas were asking me to come back. But I didn't think that would be fun. I wanted to do something that every day would be just a, a big knapsack full of fun. And I thought, movies, television, wow, that's what I'd like to do for the rest of my life. Now I had to get the president's permission, blessing, to leave. He went ballistic, see. He called me a number of things, including Benedict Arnold, but that was, only, that was one of the nicer things he called me. I'm deserting my post under fire, and, and finally I got his uh, permission because I said I'd be available. To, I'm right across the street, my office, and, and so forth, and I finally left. And then I embarked on my movie career, and that was, uh, will be 35 years come June the 1st. I've had a lot of offers to do other things, but I want to wake up in the morning eager to be about my chores. I want to be able to be, can't wait to challenge problems and kick them right in the backside. And, and I believe that to me, being with creative people is just the most exciting group of people. I find dullness to be the one sin for which there's no expiation. Creative people may be a little wacky, crazy, and off the wall, but none of them is dull. And so I find my, uh, my presence in Hollywood to be absolutely uh, thoroughly exciting and enjoyable. And uh, I listened uh, with some interest to what Michael was saying, and I, and I want to make a comment or two on one of the things he said. This uh, piece of paper here, which uh, was presented to the Senate Commerce Committee by Psychological Association and, and all these other American Medical Association. First, they said there were over a thousand pieces of research. They're not. I am retained a man named Dr. Jonathan Friedman, noted psychiatrist at the University of Toronto, who has been interested in this subject, commissioned him to do a study of every single piece of research ever made. There are 201 that are extant. And I asked him to examine the methodology, because what you see, people talk about research shows such and such, but they never tell you how they came about those conclusions. I might say, well, I took a survey yesterday, and I found that two-thirds of the people I, in this survey believe such and such. Maybe I talked to three people. Nobody questions the methodology. When you see numbers in the newspaper, somebody says the Jupiter research firm said that by the year 2004, there are going to be 18 million people doing this or that. By whose lights? How did you come to that conclusion? What's, how did you get that number? What's the provenance of your conclusion? Now, much of this research that they talked about is bogus. I went to each one of these people and I said, please tell me, wrote a letter. Please give me the research on which you depended for the conclusions that you reached in a paper you presented to the Congress. Guess what? Not one single answer from any of these groups. What Dr. Friedman found that Professor Aaron, whose research is really, is really the bedrock from which, on the platform which sprung all of these conclusions, Dr. Aaron allegedly had about 250 kids at age five or six. And if you get kids in a room and you show them action pictures today, they'll get a little aggressive for about 20 minutes. And then he was going to check on them as they moved through life, finally finishing up when they're in their 20s. When he got to the end, guess what? There were three people left. His conclusion, which Dr. Friedman pressed him on, and he had to admit, but it's based on three cases. Now, if that's scientific inquiry, uh, give me uh, creationism, and I'll, to hell with evolution. If that's, uh, if that's scientific, uh, that's number one. Number two, when the people who want to say we're going to go after violence, and I will tell you, if, maybe if you want to know later on, just yesterday, Senator Joe Lieberman, Senator Herb Cole, and Senator Hillary Clinton introduced a bill in the Congress which is going to give power to the Federal Trade Commission 
to make judgments about rating systems and then be able to find somebody who is, re who is advertising violent material to children, $11,000 a day per violation, which could be several million dollars in fines if somehow you did this. But by whose definition? Now, you're all, many of you are lawyers to be. You will know that there can be no law in which you specify a crime unless you define what the crime is. Is that correct? Right. All right. Therefore, before you find somebody or you put him in jail, you've got to say you violated this crime. Now, as I said at lunch, in the Constitution is a clause called due process. What the hell is that? Lawyers have gotten rich going into court debating what's due process. What is the responsible man's reaction? How many law cases on that? Because you're dealing, you're walking down ill-lit corridors where there are no definitions. You're not dealing with Euclidean geometry of Boyle's law of gases here. You're dealing with subjectivity. The Supreme Court to this hour, to this hour cannot define obscenity or pornography. No redeeming social value, okay? Community standards, very fine, but what the hell is that? The answer is they can't define it. So I'm saying I don't know what impact a movie has on anybody. All I know is the New York Times did profiles. Well, let me, let me finish that thought since I'm, I'm not dealing from a written text here. The only point is that I said in a press conference yesterday, which was reported today in, in the Wall Street Journal and certainly in the trade press and in the Los Angeles Times, I said, I do not believe that this bill can bear constitutional scrutiny, and I believe if it were passed, it would be dead on arrival in the first federal district court to hear it. You cannot, you cannot invade the First Amendment. Senator Clinton said yesterday, well, I think that we put uh, content on cereal boxes, and therefore we can do the same thing, content on movies. Senator Clinton, a fine lawyer, overlooks one thing. Cereal boxes, Hershey bars, Campbell's soups, alcohol, and tobacco are products not protected by the First Amendment and therefore are subject to government scrutiny. Never before has the Federal Trade Commission intervened in a First Amendment pure speech protected material. And even Senate Chairman Potofsky of the FTC, you should read his letter, Michael. His letter says to Genesis John McCain last November, when John McCain said, we want to give you more power to charge movie industry with deceptive advertising. And he said, Senator, there are serious First Amendment problems here. We can't do that. You might be able to craft narrowly tailored language. But in the letter, Chairman Potosky never gave a clear example of what narrowly tailored language is. The First Amendment has 45 words in it. I don't know how many of you have read it lately or have read it at all. It says Congress shall pass no law, no law, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the power of the people peaceably to assemble and petition their government for a redress of grievances. 45 words. It is the one clause on which all the Constitution depends for its endurance. It is the one clause in this greatest of all documents ever struck off by the hand and brain of man which guarantees all other clauses. So I'm saying to you that before Congress tampers with free speech, they better be very careful. I just came from an editorial board meeting in the Chicago Tribune today. And as I walked to the office of the editorial board, there engraved on this wall is an excerpt from a decision by Mr. Justice John Marshall Harlan, in which he said, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing now, that the First Amendment says that the freedom of speech and of the press is an attribute of American citizenship, and that no Congress or no state can by legislative or judicial action break that First Amendment. So 
I do not, uh, there are some movies I wouldn't defend if my life depended on it. I, I find some movies meretricious and tawdry and squalid and totally without merit. I'm not going to tell you which ones, though, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, and some of them are so bad we have to subpoena people to get them to the box office. We understand that. <laughs> There's only one movie that I have ever publicly criticized in all my years, and that movie is JFK by Oliver Wendell Stone. <laughs> <laughs> I found it a tissue of lies. And I said this to Oliver Stone. It was on the front page of the New York Times. And I remember that I went to Warner Brothers at that time and I said, I cannot be mute and watch this film. I saw it with my 13-year-old daughter. When she came out, she says, Daddy, is that the way it was? I went crazy. I couldn't believe. And I determined that I was going to strike back. And I said to the head of Warner Brothers, I'm going public and denounce this film. He said, you can't do that. You're the head of my industry. You have responsibilities. And I said, you know something? You're right. Therefore, I intend to call a board of directors meeting this week. I'm going to resign my post. Well, he said, I don't think you ought to do that either. And I made a compact with him. I was going to wait till after all the voting was done for the Academy Awards, because JFK had several nominations. Thank the Lord, it only got one, I think, editing or some facocta thing like that. <laughs> At any rate, then I went public and I denounced it. But having said that, I would not want to stand in the way of Oliver Stone's right to make that picture. None of us is the repository of all wisdom. And I always say it's hard to be a First Amendment man, particularly today, because you have to allow that which you find unworthy, unwholesome, slimy to enter the marketplace. And sometimes we all get so vexed, so angry, that we want to call our congressman and say, pass a law and stop this slime from entering my house. And I always say, though, before you make that call, be wary and be cautious. Because throughout history, whenever a tyrant appears, he always comes as your protector. Look throughout history. That's the way they all started. And I'm saying to you that these wise old men in 1787 that wrote it all down on a piece of parchment knew what the hell they were doing. They made it possible for anybody to worship God as he or she believes they ought to. Who's to say that your religion is right and mine is wrong. Nobody. It means you can read any book you want to read. And I remember I took my young son. This is my, you'll be interested to know this is my final denouement here. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, I know everybody's got, God, that's wonderful. You're all smiling. Uh, I took my son to Omaha Beach when he was about 14 years old. And I took him to Omaha Beach and we gazed down on that sand that was still, in my judgment, running red with the blood that had been spilled there in 1944. Then I took him up to the cemetery on land deeded to America by France. This is American land now. And I took him to that cemetery and let him see these marble crosses and stars of David in serried ranks, row upon row upon row, as far as the eye could see. And then I took him, I wanted him to read these mute markers that had this brief recounting of a young boy's life. Name, rank, outfit, and the day died. 75% of those 9,386 graves are inhabited by boys 18 to 23. I said, John, do you realize these kids were just four years older than you? You know what? The liberty that you take for granted is a gift bought and paid for in blood and in bravery. And by damn, don't you ever forget it. That's why I believe the First Amendment is worthy of being protected, even at the cost of having things that you find absolutely squalid and unwholesome to enter your life because that means that the government cannot ever interrupt 
your speech or intervene in your choice of what you want to read, think, hear, or see. And if you don't think that's a worthy gift that these young boys bought for you, John, I said, I, I need to talk to you a little bit more. Well, I am quite fascinated with what I'm saying up here, and I, <laughs> and I, could, uh, I could go on longer, but uh, I know there's supposed to be a debate here, and I probably ought to save some of my bomos or for that later on. Yeah, Thank we, you. We don't use the word debate. We use the word colloquial. <laughs> That's, that's the good thing about being Jack Valenti. Even if you weren't quite sure what to speak about, you could toss out the Kennedy anecdotes. <laughs> what am I going to do? Talk about the time I wrote a letter to Jimmy Carter and he didn't write back. You know, that was a, a big memory for me. See, and, I, and I'm in Chicago, so they told me what the program was going to be about. So, like, you know, I wrote this. So we'll just, we'll just put the watch here. You let me know when I get to you know, on the elevator on the way up, can everybody hear me, by the way? Sure. On the elevator on the way up, uh, uh, Mr. Valeni noted that there were many women waiting as the, uh, as the fine elevator system here was stopping on every floor. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the professors noted that 53% of the students here are women, which I think is, is really terrific. 88% um, will be representing Robert Downey Jr. at some point in their careers, <laughs> which is a stat that I just came up with. Um, <laughs> You know, ever since I took a, a seat across uh, Roger Ebert last year permanently, or we hope permanently anyway, um, not a day goes by without somebody asking me the question, how many movies do you see? In fact, actually, there's another question people ask me, which is a little frightening. They say, do you have to see the movies before you talk about them on the show? <laughs> people, I swear to God, people ask me that a lot. And I say, yeah, I say well, you know, that's an interesting suggestion. I'm going to take it up with, uh, with the staff. Yes, we, we do have to see them before we talk about them on the show. Uh, the answer to the question of how many movies I see is all of them. Uh, that's approximately 300 movies a year, about five or six movies a week, and that is the best part and the worst part about the job. I mean, obviously, it's a wonderful perk. It beats working for a living, unless that day's lineup includes a Sylvester Stallone racing car movie, <laughs> followed by an Adam Sandler's latest comedy and maybe a three-hour Dutch epic on clog dancing. <laughs> You think I'm joking. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit uh, in terms of the rating system about two movies I've seen recently. Uh, they couldn't be more different. One is called The Claim. It's an epic, heart-shattering story of love and greed and betrayal in 1867 California. It's just out now in Chicago. It was released uh, toward the end of last year for Oscar consideration in just one or two theaters, but it's just now rolling out. It was actually number three on my list of movies that were released last year. That's how much I liked it. Uh, loosely based on Thomas Hardy's novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge. It's the story of a man who rules the town of Kingdom Come by virtue of the mining claim he purchased as a young man, the price for that mining claim being his own wife and baby daughter. Twenty years later, the wife and daughter return just as a railroad man is deciding whether the tracks will pass through the town. If not, the town is doomed. I thought the claim was beautifully shot. It's a very serious film. It tackles a lot of serious subjects in an adult manner. There is some rough language. Uh, there's a couple of scenes set in a whorehouse, so there's nudity. There's a scene where a man gets whipped, and there's some gunplay. But the gunplay and the claim is not done as it's done in a peck-and-paw movie with stylized slow-motion shots, or as you see in a lot of the Die Hard movies. It's done in a very serious way, very realistic fashion. Uh, for those elements of the story, the claim was rated R. Now, in Joe Dirt, <laughs> Uh, starring David Spade, which is not based on a Thomas Hardy novel. Uh, Spade plays a brain-damaged janitor with a permanent mullet cut who roams the country in search of the parents who dumped him when he was just eight years old. Now, normally, leaving your child behind when he's eight is a felony. In this case, it's an understandable action. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you some of the highlights of Joe Dirt, and uh, there's no way around uh, some of these scenes. Uh, there's a scene in which uh, Spade finds what he thinks is a meteor. And I'm so glad that not all of you are nodding in agreement like you've already seen the movie and you're familiar with it, so bless you for that. Uh, he thinks he's found a meteor which has dropped out of the sky. It turns out to be a frozen chunk of human waste that has been dropped from an airplane. He eats a burger off of that, uh, that chunk. Uh, there's another scene that goes on for quite a long time 
in which Joe comes across a dog whose testicles are stuck to the front porch of a home, and using warm water and a spatula, Joe is able to free the dog. Uh, there are several instances of characters passing gas. There's a scene of Joe getting pelted with hot dogs and chili in a school cafeteria. There's a scene of a man mooning Joe. There's a scene where Joe gets turned on by the possibility that the woman he's having sex with just might be his sister. There's a scene where a dog humps Joe's leg. And there are jokes about Joe being sexually assaulted by a psycho killer. And the big scene in Joe Dirt is Joe getting slimed with tons of pure human waste. Joe Dirt is rated PG-13. Now, with all due respect to Mr. Valenti and the MPA, uh, there are moments when the rating system don't quite seem to work for me. I know that I'd be a lot more comfortable sending a class of high school freshmen to see the claim than Joe Dirt. In fact, I wouldn't send my worst enemy to Joe Dirt. But unlike my colleague, my partner, Mr. Ebert, I'm not so sure there's a better way to assign ratings to films. There are different things we could do, different ratings we can assign, no matter what set of parameters we put around these films, there's going to be some disagreement. I think the system right now, at least most people do understand what a G movie will have in it, a PG movie, PG-13, R, or NC-17. And as Mr. Valenti well knows, if you don't want your movie to be rated, you don't have to submit it for ratings. And there are films that come out unrated, um, including a movie called Center of the World, which is a fantastic movie um, and, and probably would have gotten an NC-17. In most cases, though, the ratings do fit the content. The other thing is, and I think we're sometimes naive about this in the media, and we forget about when we were teenagers, no matter what a movie is rated, if teenagers want to see it, they're going to see it. I bet some of you got to see some R movies before you turned 17. I doubt on the day you turned 17, you said, yippee, now I get to go see R-rated movies. Uh, there are many different ways, of course, to see these, whether it's in theaters, on video, uh, DVD. Uh, there was a story recently, I believe, in the Los Angeles Times about uh, kids sneaking in to see Freddy Got Fingered, which is the Tom Green movie, which is rated R. Uh, you know, you buy a ticket for a movie like Spy Kids, you go into the 50-screen megaplex, you wander around a little bit, and then you go into the to this theater that's showing uh, Freddy Got Fingered. And the FTC and some of these senators talk a lot about enforcement of the R rating, which sounds good in press conferences and in newspaper articles, but let's be honest, you go to the movie theater, who's there to enforce the R rating? It's either a kid who's 16 years old or somebody who's 112 and it's the last job they have and they're getting paid six bucks an hour and they're really not going to tackle you and pin you down and restrain you if you're caught sneaking into the movie. So, you know, I, I think this, this idea that, that 17 is the magic age is, is not something that really applies in the real world, nor can parents shield their kids from R-rated movies, no matter what you try to do. I mean, you can, you can ban R-rated movies from your home. You can ban the music of Eminem from your home and video games like Doom and Quake, but the minute your son or daughter walks out the door, you really can't control what they're going to do. And I think if you, if you take an Osmond family approach, if you will, to this thing and say, you know, none of these things are available in my house, your child is all the more likely to seek these things out the minute she does walk out the door. So kids are going to see this stuff. The stuff is everywhere. I'm not going to try to pretend either that the media don't thrive on violent images, whether we're talking about TV newscasts or network programs, pop music, films, magazines, and of course the internet, where of course more, most 14-year-olds are way more adept than most 50-year-olds at navigating the internet anyway. Uh, we're talking about studies and surveys, and you can twist these any way you want, but I am going to talk about some of them. One very well-publicized study found that anyone watching a typical night of mainstream television is likely to view a scene with seriously violent content every four minutes given that the average person watches at least a couple of hours of TV a day, the exposure obviously is off the charts. What concerns me is what that exposure does to people, how it affects them, and what is this correlation that we always hear about between violence that people consume through TV and movies and music and video games and internet, and whether or not they go out and act on this. Now, if we're to believe certain United States senators and other activists, the root cause of violence in this country is violence in the media. They'll cite everything from the music of Ice-T to some of the movies we've talked about, TV shows such as Murphy Brown. These are supposedly the major contributors of the breakdown of our society. Um, we talked a little bit earlier, and I'm going to expound on uh, this weapon, Natural Born Killers, which has been cited more than anything else. Here, this is this guy sat in the front row, so he gets the perk. Because studies also show that people always sit in the back for speeches because they're afraid they're going to get called on, but you never know. You might get a perk. But we're going to watch you carefully to see how you act after you watch that movie. So, 
Now, since its release in 1994, Natural Born Killers has been uh, by Oliver Sharon Stone, I believe, is the uh, director of that. Uh, Natural Born Killers has been cited as a source of evil in a number, a number of crime cases. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about, or heard a little bit about some of those before, and I'm going to tell you about some other ones. In 1994, 22-year-old Louis Gilbert and 16-year-old Eric Elliott, who hailed from a small town in Ohio, went on a killing spree that took them through Missouri, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. Their crimes included the torture and execution-style slaying of an elderly couple in their 80s, Investigators said Gilbert and Elliot were inspired by, and that's always the word that's used in news stories. If you do a Nexus search or a Lexus search on these things, they always say they were inspired by natural born killers. Uh, that same year, a 34 year old man and a 22 year old man busted out of a drug rehab clinic, went on a murder rampage that stretched from Missouri to California. They also, along the way before they were caught, reportedly boasted that they were inspired by natural born killers. In uh, Tennessee in 1997, one of uh, six people who were accused of murdering a family of three told police she had watched Natural Born Killers with a friend and said that it made her want to go across the country killing people. In New York State that same year, a man turned his son in for the fatal shooting of an off-duty firefighter, saying that he feared his son would kill again. The man said that his son fantasized about acting out scenes from Natural Born Killers. And the case that that you are, most of you are familiar with and that was touched on earlier in Elgin, uh, Natural Born Killers was once again cited. That man, Luther Castile, was a local guy. He went to this JB's pub quite often, uh, got drunk that night, was pestering the customers, was kicked out of the bar. He went home, he grabbed four guns, 200 rounds of ammunition, shaved his head, donned military garb, returned to the bar and started shooting, killing two people and wounding 21 others. And uh, in addition to some of the comments his girlfriend has made to the press, some of the eyewitnesses there at the bar said he was actually shouting lines from natural born killers as he was shooting. Um, obviously, as in the other cases, this guy watched the movie. It affected him in a certain way. But if you look at some of the other details from the life of this Luther Castile, you'll see some factors that contributed to him getting to that point that I would think had a lot bigger influence than natural born killers. By the time he was 16, he had been arrested 15 times. He had been labeled a career criminal by therapists. His troubles included convictions for robbery and theft. There was an incident in which he threatened to shoot his former wife before shooting the gun off into a pillow. He has a history of mental problems, and his alcoholism is so severe that he's often subject to blackouts. In fact, he does not remember, or at least claims he does not remember, anything from the night of the shootings. Now, if you go back on that night in question, if you remove alcohol from the equation, if Luther Castile somehow makes it through the night without drinking at all, my guess is that nobody gets shot. Maybe he gets a, into a brawl with the bouncer, maybe he goes home and passes out if he does drink, but again, if there are no guns un available to him, nobody gets shot. But if you take the same mental problems, the same drinking problem, the same criminal history, the same access to weapons, and you remove natural born killers, does anybody honestly believe this wouldn't have happened? This is my problem with people who say that they were inspired by a movie to create violence. We have this tendency to believe that just because things happen in chronological order, that the thing that happened here made the next thing happen, that this caused that. And correlation is not the same as cause and effect. Uh, if you study any of the previously mentioned shootings, you'll find that each of the suspects had far deeper problems than watching violent movies. It's never as simple as someone sitting at home with a clean record and a clean conscience. They watch a couple of movies, their behavior changes. That's never the case. Sometimes the news stories make it sound that way. Uh, we also heard a little bit about the battle between John Grisham and Oliver Stone about the case with the, uh, the two 19-year-olds in Oklahoma who went on a, on a crime spree in 1995. Now, I assume most of you know that John Grisham is, a, is a, an attorney and he's written novels that have sold more than 100 million copies worldwide. Most of his novels have been turned into mainstream movies like The Firm and The Pelican Brief. Now, the Grisham Stone battle started in this manner. In 1995, 19-year-old Sarah Edmondson and Benjamin Darris left their home in Oklahoma and went on a crime spree that included the shooting of a convenience store clerk named Patsy Byers. Byers was paralyzed by the gunshot wound. She uh, was a paraplegic. Uh, she actually died a few years later from unrelated natural causes uh, due to cancer that she had. John Grisham is friends with her family, and he was understandably outraged about what had happened to her. But Grisham directed his ire not at the shooters, not at the criminals, but 
at Oliver Stone and the makers of Natural Born Killers. He felt that Stone had to be, felt, had to be held responsible. The Oxford American is a publication that Grisham actually owns a piece of, and writing in the Oxford American, he made the comparisons uh, to companies that produce products such as cigarettes and breast implants that have been blamed for health problems. He said movie makers should be targeted for similar product liability suits. Now here's what John Grisham wrote. A film is a product not too dissimilar from breast implants. If something goes wrong with the product, whether by design or by defect, <coughs> and injury ensues, then its makers are held responsible. It will take only one large verdict against the likes of Oliver Stone and his production company, and perhaps the screenwriter and the studio, and the party will be over. Those are really chilling words coming from somebody, especially who's someone who's an attorney and a writer. <clears throat> I mean, think about what he's saying here, what exactly what he's saying here. A film is a product, and if something goes wrong with the product, its makers are held responsible. In other words, if you make a movie and it inspires someone to commit a crime, it's your fault. I find that to be an astonishing concept coming from someone like John Grisham. If the courts did back his beliefs, which so far they have not, nobody would ever be able to make a movie or a TV show or record an album or write a book without fear of being held responsible for any nutcase who might consume the product before committing a crime. The risk would just be too great. <clears throat> what Grisham calls the party is what I call free speech, and indeed it would be over. Let's consider one of John Grisham's books, uh, A Time to Kill. Um, I don't know if any of you read that or saw the movie. It starred Samuel Jackson, Matthew McConaughey, and Ashley Judd. Uh, the story starts, a story written by Grisham, starts with a horrific episode in which two backwoods creeps rape a 10-year-old girl. The little girl's father shows up at their arraignment with a gun and murders them in cold blood in front of hundreds of people. A police officer is also wounded in the shooting, but in Grisham's death wish world, the cop said he's not mad about getting shot. In fact, he thinks the shooter is a hero, despite the damage the shooting did to himself. In the story, the father is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, but he's acquitted by reasons of temporary insanity, although the jury's really swayed a lot more by the attorney's emotional arguments about this father's daughter being raped. I've read the book and I've seen the film, and in both cases, the story is nothing but a well-crafted, slickly produced advertisement for vigilanteism. In fact, I believe Natural Born Killers is actually a work of superior moral values if you get away from all the media hype and actually watch the two films. Now imagine if something like what happens in Grisham's story, A Time to Kill, actually happened in real life. An innocent child is gravely wounded, the father of the child takes the law into his own hands and guns down the assailants. What if the father said he was inspired by a time to kill? According to Grisham's own logic, he would be held responsible for the shootings. As was mentioned earlier, the family of Patsy Byers did bring a suit against Stone and Time Warner, uh, saying he should have known his movie would incite people to kill. Uh, that claim has twice been denied. Um, there's another appeal going on right now. It doesn't seem as if a case like that could be won, but the fact that somebody like John Grisham would be backing something like that is just astonishing to me. And just as a point of fact, those teenagers who went on that killing spree, uh, you know, they had access to a gun that one of their uh, fathers owned, uh, and they were dropping huge amounts of acid before they went on the killing spree. So obviously a lot more things other than natural born killers inspired them. And of course, as always is, is the case with these stories, I think something like 50 million people probably by now have seen natural born killers. It was a moderate hit when it came out. It grossed about 50 million, but it's played worldwide, and if you factor in DVD and video, out of those 50 million people, obviously 99.9%, .9%, including hopefully this youngster right here, will see the movie and not be inspired to go out and commit mayhem. Of course, Natural Born Killers is not the only media entity that has been blamed as the catalyst for violence. Remember in the wake of the Columbine shootings, we heard that the so-called trench coat mafia, which in and of itself turned out to be a lot of hype, it was really just really these two sad loners named Harris and Klebold. We heard that they were fans of a German techno band by the name of KMFDM. They were fans of Marilyn Manson, The Matrix, The Crow. Of course, then again, many of the victims of these shootings were probably fans of movies like The Matrix and The Crow, but you don't hear that in the news stories because that complicates the soundbite that confuses the headline. Then the media jumped all over themselves having these ridiculous overreactions to the Columbine tragedy. It, you know, it's been two years since Columbine, and uh, it now seems ludicrous that the WB chose not to run 
the season ending episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, if any of you remember, the final episode that season, uh, there was a big shootout in a school hall, school hallway between some students and the school's principal who had turned into a 60 foot serpent. And they said they didn't want to show that because they just didn't want to send the wrong message to kids out there because you know, you could get some copycat episodes of 60 foot serpents being gunned down by good looking vampire hunters in the halls of schools. And two months later they did run that episode and no serpents were subsequently killed. Now, we mentioned earlier, we've heard earlier about how you can, you can move statistics around, but these are some pretty solid numbers I want to include because they're usually ignored in most of these discussions about media violence and in particular how media violence affects young people. Uh, crime is down. Crime has fallen to its lowest level in nearly 30 years nationwide. A nationwide study of violent crime in 1998 that had been conducted every year for the last 27 years found that violent crime in 1998 was at the lowest point it had been since they started the survey. In another study, violent crime by children and teens in 1999 was at its lowest since 1987. In fact, violent crime by children and teens has fallen 30% since 1994. That's the year Natural Born Killers was released, and using the same kind of logic that's sometimes used against it, I could say, well, the movie was, was released in 94, and, and crime has gone down among teens since then, so let's give credit where credit is due. Apparently, somehow, it's a deterrent to crime. Uh, the arrest rate uh, for weapons violations among juveniles has dropped 33% since 1993. School violence, believe it or not, including fistfights, injuries, and weapons carried through doors, has been falling steadily since 1991. Um, here in Chicago, I just pulled the most recent stats, there were 627 murders in the city last year. That's obviously still a, a huge number, but that's the lowest rate it's been in 33 years. The record murder rate in Chicago is 970 murders committed in 1974. I think most people, if you ask them, would tell you that crime has been going up for the last 30 years. It's simply not true. You can bend and shape these stats, as I said, in any direction, but the truth is there was more violent crime in Chicago and in the United States in 1974 and even in 1994 than there is today. But we all agree, of course, that the media have grown so much since then. You've got VCRs and DVDs and cable TV and the internet. So today's teenager is obviously exposed to an exponentially greater amount of violence, but is apparently not acting on that. So why is it then that Joe Lieberman and Hillary Clinton and so many other legislators and educators and commentators and concerned citizens, uh, citizens spend so much time talking about violence in the media, I think part of it actually can be blamed on the media, not the movie makers and not the TV producers that are putting out the works of fiction, but the news organizations that give so much play to violent crime on the evening news and sensationalize so many murders and always mention if the killer or alleged gunman was a fan of a, a particular movie. You see this over and over in the news media and you do believe it to be true. Uh, this doesn't mean that I, I find the creative media totally blameless. I mean, especially in terms of we're talking about marketing R-rated movies to kids. You know, that's wrong, and the companies know it's wrong, and they shouldn't do it. Uh, I'm a little concerned about, uh, more than a little concerned about the government getting involved in that. But if a movie's rated R and it's not supposed to be seen by 17-year-olds unless they're accompanied by an adult, it is wrong for the media companies to go after the 12-year-old audience. But I don't know how we can regulate such practices without violating the First Amendment, and I'd rather let those practices slide by and keep the First Amendment than weaken it in any way. Nor am I arguing that some people are not influenced by what they see and hear. Obviously, when somebody dresses up like a character from a movie and quotes lines from a movie and kills in a manner that copies a scene from the movie, he's been affected by the movie. But I think there are other things that are always going to be cited as contributing to his behavior that are going to be more important and had more of an impact on him than the damn movie. That could be anything from genetics to drug dependency to abuse to mental illness to social conditioning to education to the fact that some people are just plain rotten to the core. These factors put somebody in a position where they might be stupid enough and vicious enough to take movie violence and turn it into real life violence. I mean, we see these, these episodes where people are imitating what they see on MTV. Jackass, you know that show, Jackass, there, were just, there was just a a story in the news this week about a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old. They wanted to get on the show Jackass. If you don't know this show, congratulations, but <laughs> it stars a guy who goes by the name of Johnny Knoxville, and he basically puts himself at risk 
in the name of entertainment. You know, bar he barbecues himself, he sets himself on fire, and you know, MTV puts out a disclaimer: "Don't try this at home." And uh, kids see this, and they, you know, they think, "Wow, it's not that hard to get on TV. I just have to hurt myself." So. These two, these two kids, a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old, decided they're going to videotape themselves in a death-defying stunt. So one kid gets behind the wheel of a car. They've got about three or four cameras, video cameras, showing this. One kid gets behind the wheel of the car, and the other kid stands in the middle of the street. Now, you can see even among these two kids, there's a pecking order going on here, right? Because one kid says, I'll stand in the middle of the street, and, I'll, and the other kid says, I'll drive. You know, the driver's the one that's going to maybe get that fast food job one day, at least. <laughs> so... The 17-year-old is driving toward his buddy, and the idea would be that his buddy would jump out of the way at the last time. What a death-defying stunt. And they'll send that tape to MTV, and maybe they'll get on the Jackass show. Uh, their timing was a little off, so the car actually hit the boy, and he bounced off the car, uh, suffering a broken leg and internal injuries. And they were also uh, charged with wanton endangerment, which is a felony. And on top of all that, MTV issued a statement saying, we don't accept tapes <laughs> from viewers. <laughs> Obviously, these kids are affected by what they see, but I still don't even think something like jackass should be taken off the air. There was another uh, kid recently, a teenager. I think he was trying to get Tom, they said he was trying to get the attention of Tom Green or jackass or one of these shows. And, you know, Tom Green was a cable access talent who made his name by pulling off these stunts and videotaping them. He, you know, he put a cow's head literally in his parents' bed and filmed the reaction to this, things like that. And believe it or not, that has led to uh, motion picture stardom and uh, MTV stardom, and Drew Barrymore for Tom Green. Uh, in Minneapolis, a 19-year-old man thought he would try to do the same kind of stunt. So he put on a hospital gown and a welder's mask, and he went out to an intersection wielding a chainsaw, and he had his buddy videotape that. Um, when police arrested him, he said, quote, dude, all of us were just playing a joke in the street. We just wanted to see how people would react. Well, they would react by arresting you, dude. <laughs> But despite the actions of a few geniuses like that, I still believe this stuff should be broadcast. If people act on it, it's their responsibility. Whether you're talking about watching Natural Born Killers or listening to Eminem, playing Doom and Quake, seeing violent movies, again, 99% of the people who watch that are not inspired to commit any sorts of crimes. You could take every R-rated movie off the shelves. You could remove every obscenity from every CD. You could destroy every violent video game, and crime wouldn't skip a beat. The, the, the guns would still be there. The drugs would still be there. The poverty, the hatred, the breakdown of the family unit, all the real factors that have come to play when there is violence, they'd all still be there. Uh, I'm going to leave you with just one more uh, set of numbers. Um, as you probably know, most of the movies we, we make here in the United States are now marketed internationally. In fact, a lot of the big action movies, the violent movies, obviously, it translate real well. You know, I mean, pow, bang, boom, you don't have to have a translator for that. So movies like Die Hard and Lethal Weapon, they'll make at least as much money in the international markets as they do here in the United States. So pretty much what we're looking at right now, people in many different countries are consuming the same products. They're listening to the same music. They're watching the same violent movies. They've got access to the same violent uh, video games. But if you look at the numbers, Canada averages about 100 handgun murders per year. And Great Britain averages about 30 per year. Japan, about 12. But even in the, in the United States, even though the crime rate does continue to drop, we have about 9,000 handgun murders per year. If we're watching the same shows and we're going to the same movies and we're listening to the same music, why does the U.S. have a murder rate that's 30 or 40 or 100 times greater than just the difference in the size of population from these countries? I would suggest that maybe it has to do with access to handguns and the people who supply those guns and the people who use those guns. They are the real natural born killers. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, as a chairperson, I will exercise my dictatorial powers to ask the first question. Uh, Mr. Valenti, you, you mentioned, I think with some justification, there's serious question about causation, at least simple causation. And if I understand you, you are uh, an agnostic about the effect of violent movies on, on society. Uh, I find it also interesting, though, that you had many years as an advertising man and a political consultant. Uh, would you say that the advertising industry operates on the premise that it can influence behavior? Or do you, you see a difference? 
Well, I think there's a vast difference between urging somebody to go out to buy a can of Campbell soups and urging somebody to get a Glock 9 and blow somebody's head off. I mean, there's a, the difference between those two acts is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. It's a, it, uh, a great difference. All I'm saying to you is, I don't know. I know that all the studies that I've seen, such as the New York Times about two months ago, took 100, 101 killings. Started with 1924, with Leopold and Loeb right here in Chicago. Famous case where Leopold and Loeb tortured these children, this young, young boy, and murdered him in an unmerciful way, 1924. And of course, the, the defense pleaded that bad movies and bad television at that time uh, caused them to do that. 1924. All I'm saying to you is you are dealing with a mystery wrapped inside a riddle, inside a conundrum. It, there's, no, there's no way you can figure this out. All of the studies show correlations, but none of them show causal. Now, if you smoke enough cigarettes, eventually you'll get emphysema or cancer of the lungs. If you take a bottle of bourbon and you drink it all in one sitting, you're going to get drunk. Now, that's a fact. You can't, you can't deny that. It's not the same thing with these subtle shadowings of the human mind. Now, the computer is the smartest piece of technology, in my modest judgment, to ever come along in my lifetime. The computer can do everything except one thing. The computer cannot predict human behavior. Now, if you don't believe that, then you should invest your money with a company called Long-Term Capital Management Company that had two Nobel Prize winners who did computer models to show how people would react in the stock market. And guess what? They went belly up and lost billions of dollars for themselves and their clients because the computer can't do it. We're dealing with the labyrinth of the human mind, and doctors will tell you today there are things about the human brain they do not know, and there are portions of the human brain which have not yet been explored. And finally, Richard mentioned Columbine. I remember watching Tom Brokaw interview 40 students two weeks after Columbine, and two Columbine seniors were there. So he addresses a lovely young senior and said, well, I suppose that uh, <coughs> Uh, this scenes of violence and things that you saw had a lot to do with this violence. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. There are 1,800 students at Columbine. We all watch the same movies. We all play the same video game. And we all listen to the same music. But only two of them turn out to be killers. And next to her, her companion, a senior, said, those two guys were crazy. So I don't know the answer. But on the other hand, the most knowledgeable scientists in the world don't know the answer. The human brain is kind of, we're, we're kind of like Lewis and Clark exploring the human brain. We don't know what's on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Same way it goes. That's the only answer I can give you because there is no other answer. Yes, thank you. Okay, any, any other questions? Yes. Of course they do. I mean, everybody should be responsible when they're creating their art or, or producing their product. I mean, one of the things I mentioned is responsibility among the news media in reporting on these things, and whether it's Columbine or any other shooting. Uh, you know, it's not what we use in the, in the news business. We use the term sexy to mean that how, how are you going to sell it as a front page story or as lead story. It's not sexy to say, well, the killer was, uh, he comes from a, a broken home and he was abused as a child and he has a problem with alcohol and he is, you know, people just start cl clicking the channels. But if you say he was a fan of natural born killers, people stop and watch and they want to hear what, 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 how this movie affected this guy. In terms of the makers of movies and the producers of TV shows, yeah, they should have res they should be responsible. So should, you know, parents should be responsible, and, and friends should be responsible, and clergy should be responsible as well. I don't think the government is the body that should be holding these producers responsible for what they put out there, because once you start on that slope, you're going to slide into a place that none of us want to go to. 
Who should ultimately be responsible? The individual should be responsible. That's who should be responsible. And the individual who produces the material, and more importantly, the individual who consumes it. We're all ultimately, I believe, responsible for our own actions. And that includes what, no matter how terrible your childhood is or how many problems you have, you have a responsibility to act within the parameters of decent society and civilization, which means you don't hurt other people. My answer to that is that you have in your power an awesome authority. You have the power not to listen to what you don't want to hear, not to patronize a movie you find squalid, not to read a book which you find obscene, and you have the power to instruct your children. Now, it seems to me there are only three places where you build a moral shield inside a child. One is the home, the other is a school, and the third is a church. Those are the three citadels where the construction of that moral shield is built. Now, if parents are languid in their attention to their children, they brought them into the world, if clerics abandon their responsibility, if teachers are enfeebled in the way they teach children, then that, there's no way that you're going to salvage that child's conduct or locate some lost moral core. Now, that's the reality of life. All of us have, mothers of married have children. Thank God, I don't know why, my, my children have grown up with their heads on straight. I, I thank God every night for that. I don't claim any superior knowledge. Maybe it's because my wife spent a lot of time with them. She cared about them. But the responsibility is in each of us. And you can't blame somebody else if your child goes wrong if you haven't taken care of that child. So I, I don't like a lot of movies, and I find some of them to be totally irresponsible. But if you don't like me, pick at the theater. The First Amendment says you can peaceably assemble. Tell your friends not to go there. Don't watch a certain television show. Guess what? If enough people don't attend the movie or enough people don't watch that program, it's going off the air. So you are not reclaiming the great authority you have when you say, let them be responsible, but I don't have to be responsible. I'm not saying that to you personally, sir. I don't mean that. I mean in a general, generic sense. Yes. Mr. Valenti, <clears throat> as the acceleration of technology pushes along the access and visibility that we see, what can you do when the next generation comes along to take over the position you see involved and people around you involved? It's a generational thing. I mean, we are looking for the Gen Xers, I think it's rubber as well, but mostly with your position, you went through the whole conclusion of voting and well, I must tell you, I'm not. Yeah, repeat the question. Turn around and repeat that question. Uh, the question was, as um, the acceleration of technology pushes access and permissiveness of what it is that we're seeing, what is, who is going to be the watchdog for the first for, for the next generation when Mr. Valenti? And all the people who, when we, when he started, there was no, there was no rating. And then you brought the war of ratings. I've watched you my whole life to fight this battle. And now, when you leave, what do we have, what can we look forward to when the next generation takes over the Gen Xers who are going to be fighting this accelerated access and, and uh, permissiveness that we'll see in the viewers and on TV? Well, I happen to be very optimistic about that. And I'll give you some historical relevance. In 1939, Britain was considered to be a, f a pacifist nation, the Neville Chamberlain line. They weren't going to fight. We passed conscription law in this country by one vote in 1940 in the House of Representatives. And there were a lot of people who didn't want to go to war. And then ordinary young men in both Britain and America did extraordinary things when they were called on to defend their country. I believe, as Will Durant once said, the young people who, who disturb our lives today will become the conservative leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> and that is, as you grow older, you get a little more wisdom. I don't even want to tell you what I did as a 14 or a 12-year-old and all the crazy things I did and, and all my friends. But as you get older, 
you begin to understand what the word responsibility is. And you begin to understand what William Faulkner called the old verities. Pity, pride, compassion, sacrifice, honor, duty, service. And I just happen to believe that uh, these young 12-year-olds who are roaming the internet and Nutella and Freenet and all the other things uh, at wa wantonly and taking down music without paying for it and glorying in it, when they get older, they get children, they'll be explaining to them why it's important to be honest and have integrity. And I might add that a lot of them will say, you know something? Let's protect the First Amendment. So I, I have great faith in this generation. It always happens that way. The past is always more pleasant because it isn't here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just want to touch on that. That's a very good question. And as Mr. Valenti said, this is a generational thing. I, I, I'm constantly amused by the people who are in their late 40s and early 50s who uh, were dancing naked at Woodstock and doing drugs and having, <laughs> letting their freak flags fr fly. And now they're saying, oh, the kids of today. Oh, you know, and, and, and I don't know what it's going to be, but today's 17-year-old, when they're 47, are going to be saying that about, the, you know, the, it, it always works that way. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Yeah, I just wanted to comment because I'm a teacher. I teach seventh and eighth grade, and about 80% of my kids are coming from really rough households. They're foster kids, and but you know what? I I agree with you both in saying like media. You cannot blame everything on the media because when you have them for six days as a teacher, and you just take them for what they are, they go with it and they appreciate it. And they're good people. I mean, you just have to be creative and you can't blame everything. Most of the time they come in and they talk about Columbine High School a lot. They talk about it all the time and they get it from the news. They don't get it from the, maybe the violent movie they caught on TV when their parents were asleep or they caught <coughs> on their, I don't know, whatever, the computer. They're all into the computer, but such the times but they're our future and we have to respect them and support it in the best way that we can and stop pointing fingers before it's all taken away. You know, I, I spoke recently to uh, an inner city classroom of second graders, which would make them about eight years old. Yeah, about that. And we were talking about some of these things, obviously in a different form, but I asked at one point how many of them knew somebody who had been killed by a gun? And you know what happened. Almost every single mm -hmm. hand in that classroom went up. That, to me, is a lot bigger problem than what video games these kids might yeah. get to see, which most of them, quite frankly, don't have in their homes anyway. Yeah, I mean, but if, if, you know, sorry to interrupt, but if, you know, if a Senate committee convenes on violence in the inner city and what we have to do to fund more education, well, you know, you're not going to get that front page of the L.A. Times. But right. if you convene to talk about how certain movies are affecting our kids, yeah. it makes for a better story. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, just the writing samples I get, it's the truest truth. They're seven years old. They're not going to think I'm saying, oh, I'm going <coughs> to trick my teacher. They're just going to write and be free about mm -hmm. it. And that's what it's all about. So, But what makes kids uh, immune to violence or maybe not, is being exposed to it in real life, mm -hmm. not necessarily seeing it on television? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I think, that might be, let me posit a comment. I think that when you discuss the role of public officials in this debate, uh, their role really is very important. And they have another agenda. We, we are experiencing here. Who are we talking about? Joe Lieberman, Hillary Clinton, and the other third senator. I don't really believe when they take to the airways to discuss these problems, they have too much by way of honesty or credibility working. And that to me is very interesting. Now, they don't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I think it's true. I think both of you gentlemen seem to come back to the idea that it is the media who causes them to be. I happen to watch the 10 o'clock news more because I find it comical <laughs> rather than I'm finding it informative. Simpsons are funnier. And, and, and sometimes more insightful about society, too, at 10 <laughs> o'clock. So I, I think that, I think that uh, when you're dealing with responsibility, uh, too often we are swayed by political agendas and articulate people using those political agendas. For their own, for their own Yes, way back there. Way back there. Um, I'm trying to redeem my conservative credentials by these comments, but the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of stuff that comes into my house, as soon as I turn on the TV, is disgusting, 
a lot of stuff on the radio is disgusting, and if you tell me turn off the radio, turn off the TV, blah, blah, blah. You, Mr. Roper, mentioned that the rating system doesn't work, or, or whatever that silly movie was that had the better rating, more permissive rating than the better movie. Doesn't the industry have a responsibility to address that and even if it's not the biggest problem, gun violence may be a bigger problem, drugs may be a big problem, it's perceived of by many, many people as offensive and, and interfering with their prerogatives and rights, and, and it makes the, the industry the enemy instead of an, an, an ally. Maybe they don't have any responsibility to be an ally, but they have no right to be the enemy. So it seems to me you guys are, are pretty flip about I'm responsible, the kid's responsible, everybody else is responsible, but you guys. And it seems to me that you have a moral obligation to s maintain the same kind of self-discipline that you want us and our kids to maintain, and that is you've got to stand up not once, Mr. Valenti, like a hero, but every, pardon the expression, I was, I'll leave out the word, every time, and, and begin to articulate some standard, or if you don't want to do that, because you don't have to pay attention to me in that sense, what you do have to do, <coughs> quite frankly, is make the rating systems work, more full disclosure, and don't fight us at every step of the way. Sure. We're entitled to know what's in those movies. I read your reviews, and you don't give us the same full disclosure you gave us today about that silly movie, nor, nor does the industry. So I, I really think, in fairness, to the rest of us in society, and frankly, to your own use of the word responsibility, that you guys have to begin to examine your own consciences and become more responsible and lead the charge in your industry. We'll lead it, she'll lead it in her school, and I'll lead it in my home and my church, but you have to do it in your industry, and there's no evidence that you guys are doing it. I don't mean you personally, but I mean the industry. Well, so if we're going to talk um, responsibility, okay, right. let's all be the same. I'll jump in real quick and then let the rating ex ratings expert yeah. uh, here. First of all, as, as far as moral responsibility, my moral responsibilities are between me and uh, whoever I answer to, and me and my audience, whether it's as a writer or as a, a reviewer on television. And um, I don't want somebody <coughs> telling anybody else telling me what my moral responsibilities are. I, I think that's a, a very dangerous thing, because then I can start telling you what your moral responsibilities but are. You and do that in your speech, in all seriousness, I don't mean to be offensive at all, but hmm? you yeah. all just do that in your speech, tell us what our moral responsibilities are. Yeah. Mr. Valente said, through my church, and as a parent, I have the moral responsibility to address these problems. You just did what you're complaining I didn't No, do. when I was asked the question, I said that I believe that the moral responsibility and the social responsibility lies with the individual. I'll take care of myself. You take care of yourself. I'm not going to try to impose my values or morals on you. So, no, I'm not contradicting myself at all. I'm being consistent in that. And that's the way I conduct myself in my personal life and in my professional life. As far as whether or not we as reviewers or the MPAA uh, gives you information, we certainly do. And I, I would suggest that on my, on my program with Roger and certainly in Roger's reviews and a lot of other media venues, you can find out as much as you want to know about a movie. There's an Internet site called, I believe it's screenit.com, that goes into unbelievable detail for parents about each and every movie that comes out and tells you exactly what references are made to drugs or if there's nudity or if there's swearing or if there's uh, disrespect toward parents. It is not my responsibility to find all these things uh, for each and every parent. You've got to seek these things out. So that's, that's my reaction to what... Uh, I expect what my answer to that is, is uh, as a person who designed this rating system and has nourished it and nurtured it to make sure its integrity remains intact. Not its subjective judgment. We've rated over almost 17,000 movies since the rating system. Of course there have been mistakes made when you have 17,000 movies. But let me just give you the following. Today, in every ad you see that's a half page or larger, sometimes a fourth of a page, if you look at the legend where it says RPG or PG-13, you will see under the legend the reasons for that rating. Then if you go to filmratings.com, you can see over 10,000 movies that have been rated since the rating system came into it. I mean, 16,000 of them. Every one of them, what the rating is and the reason for the rating. Every website for every movie that's out has on that website the reasons for that rating. Now, I don't know what else we can do. If we say this is 
strong language, harsh violence, and sensuality, and you take your five-year-old kid to see it, should we be blamed? I mean, would you, would you take a medicine that has skull and crossbones and leave it open in front of your child? Of course you wouldn't. So we're trying to give you as much information as possible. But I'm saying we have websites, the ads contain it, and I don't know what else you can do. So we try to give this information to parents. Now, by the way, when I designed this program, we were then, as we are now, the only industry in the whole United States that deliberately turns away revenues in order to fulfill a pledge we have made to parents. No other industry in this country does that. Now, I'm not saying that to show our pious attitude. I just thought it was right that we ought to do it for two reasons. One, I didn't think the government ought to have a right to step in but we can't allow a vacuum to exist. If we don't want the government to give information, then we should give it. And that's the second reason that I thought we ought to have an obligation to parents to give them some advanced cautionary warnings and let parents make this decision. To finally, I don't want my neighbor telling me how to raise my children. I would consider that an unwholesome intrusion. On the other hand, I don't want to tell my neighbor how to raise his children. That's something each of us as parents have to do. Now, as I said earlier, if you, if you treat that with casual regard, don't blame anybody. Remember, when you point your finger accusingly at somebody else, three of your own fingers point back at you. Just remember that. Okay. I got a question. When oh, I was going... Is there a question back there yeah. for somebody who hasn't answered, a asked one yet? Yes, back there. Go ahead. Can I? Uh, when I was growing up, there were a lot of family-orientated movies. That's not the case anymore. It's hard to find a good film these days. So is the, the media reflection of society, as this uh, lecture was about, or society uh, reflection of the media? What's, I want to know what your opinion on that is. Well, I think in... As always, it's a little bit of both. And you're right, there aren't a lot of movies out there right now uh, that are rated G, that aren't rated PG, uh, for parents to take their kids to. Obviously, you know, you get the animated movies, you get the Disney and the DreamWorks movies, and you get an occasional uh, G-rated uh, live action film. Uh, but there should be more of that. And you can, f you can find it by seeking it out so on, on some, of the, some of the cable stations that do original movies and some and original programming. But it's a shame, and I think I think in some cases that, that Hollywood's missing the boat if they put out uh, more standard G-rated fare that it would find an audience. But right now, for whatever reason, for a variety of reasons, if a mo movie is rated G, that's considered uh, you know the kiss of death in, in terms of commercial viability. The problem is, we don't we don't have a shortage of family pictures, but we damn sure have a shortage of family audiences. That's a problem. We give you a personal. My daughter is senior vice president at Warner Brothers. She develops movies. She developed a movie called A Little Princess. I thought it was one of the most delicious movies I've seen in a long, long time. I loved it. G-rated. It went out, and about 86 people in the Western Hemisphere paid money to see it. Now, Warner Brothers, and particularly with the passion of my daughter, withdrew the picture. Six months later, with a whole new advertising campaign, they went out again with a little princess, trying to enlist people to go see and take your kids. Disaster. Time after time, that's hot. The Iron Giant is a good example of a picture. As they say in Hollywood, in the toilet, just didn't go anywhere. It's a shame. But you see, there's a vast and ominous contradiction. What people say is not what they do. So I'm saying to you, it just shows you, if you patronize family movies, the law of economics says they're going to make more. But if you don't, they're not going to be there. Uh, it's hard to understand because Disney's been doing that for years, and they've been very successful. That is correct. You're absolutely right. And Dis the Disney brand. But Richard said something. And what happens is that a lot of kids, just as a lot of grown-ups don't want to see NC-17, a lot of kids don't want to see G. And I try to point out when I'm talking, particularly high school students, my most favorite film of all time is a G-rated film. 
the best film ever made in my frail judgment is A Man for All Seasons, story of King Henry VIII and Sir Thomas More. If you have not seen it, go down to your blockbuster store, and if you don't like that movie, I pledge you, just write me a note and I'll give you double your money back. <laughs> okay. It's one of the greatest movies ever made, and it's G-rated. Now, most people, and by the way, it won Best Picture when it came out. It did some business, but not the kind of business it ought to have done, because it's a magnificent film with, with uh, Orson Welles in it, uh, Robert Shaw, and the greatest living English-speaking actor, Paul Schofield, written by Robert Boat, directed by Fred Zinnemann. It is near perfect a film as you will ever see in your life. On the other hand, the American Film Institute put out its greatest hundred best films of all time. And guess what? Man for All Seasons was not on it. Yeah, just to, to follow up on the, on the G-rated uh, topic, you know, people forget that for many years, Disney was dying on the vine because of the G-rated movies, all those, those movies that some of us remember, you know, the, the, the Love Bug movies and Flubber and all these live action things, you know, they, they kind of ran their course. And in the early 80s, uh, Disney started with, under the imprint of Touchstone, you know, started doing more uh, uh, grown-up things like Splash. And then their, their animated movies, the ones that have made, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, they have things in there for parents as well. And that's, I think, one of the reasons those films do so well, because they, they, they work on two levels. Uh, they're, they're a little more sophisticated. And I think if some of those, some of those movies were... Uh, done in, in the style of the old-fashioned G movies, they never would have made the money they're making, especially in video rentals and, and purchases where parents have to see the same movie over and over and over. Good. Any other questions? Uh, well, I, I want to thank you all for coming. I think Mr. Valenti made a point that I would want to second, and that is that the First Amendment does work two ways. It doesn't just protect Hollywood. It protects the right of every citizen to protest. And indeed, James Madison anticipated that that's the way the First Amendment should work, that there should be these factions, as he called them, that counterbalance each other. And so if, 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 that, if that kind of balancing isn't working, it's partly our fault, as well as any fault in Hollywood, I would suggest. 